Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here on day three of this meeting. We've had some really engaging discussions uh, in the last few days, last two days, and uh, the, it would be good to think about the impact of the, the two vaccines that we're talking about, specifically from a quantification standpoint. So that's what I will be presenting some of our work to, um, today on the estimation of lives saved among children under five, so one month to 59 months in the four countries. So in the next few minutes, we'll talk about the modeled um, impact of these vaccines. So when you're thinking about how do we actually put numbers to the actual impact, so that's what we're doing. But I have to say that this is a model. So we have assumptions and we have inputs that go into the model. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about that. And the outputs would be in terms of lives saved, cases averted, and a little bit about the costs averted as well, to put those things into perspective. And then we'll spend a few minutes on understanding what these results mean. So just before I begin, I just want to um, bring our minds to the fact that when we talk about lives saved and deaths, really, we're, think we're looking at this, the tip of this whole disease prevalence pyramid. So it's just a tiny portion of everything else that's happening, which includes moderate severe disease, moderate disease, and also mild disease, and all of them contribute towards burden, severe burden or any kind of indirect burdens as well. So that's just something to keep in mind when we think of the, the numbers that we are seeing. And the reason we're doing this quantification is to give us some kind of uh, impetus on how do we make informed decisions on introduction of these new vaccines. And, and the way we're doing this, the way our, we model these numbers is using this um, instrument called the Live Saved Tool. So this is one of many models that exist, and this is developed by the Institute of International Programs at Johns Hopkins. And it's an approach that actually helps us understand the impact of many health interventions that have the impact that these interventions would have on newborn health, child health, and maternal health. So in this case, we're using vaccines as the intervention, and we are looking at the outputs. And the inputs would include the coverage of these interventions and also the effectiveness of the intervention. So that's something we would put into the model. And what we're seeing in terms of output would be the deaths in cases, as I said. So what we're doing uh, this today is looking at the outputs in five different scenarios, as you can see on the slide. So the first one would be PCV alone being introduced in 2024. The second one would be PCV and PCV catch up, because that's something we've been talking about a lot these days. And the third scenario would be rotavirus vaccine alone. And the fourth would be PCV and rotavirus vaccine alone. And the fifth would be PCV plus catch up plus rotavirus. So it's a lot, a lot of scenarios, but maybe we can focus on a few that make sense to each of the countries that are planning to do this introduction. And we're looking at the outputs among children one to 59 months of age, so under five, so not including the neonatal age group. And the numbers are, the, the model is for the next seven years or so, because we're starting from 2023 this year, introduction assumed in 2024, and all the way through 2030. And we're looking at 2030, uh, the IA 2030 targets of 90% coverage, and I'll come to that as well. So a little bit about the assumptions that we are going into the model, and I won't go through them too much in detail. Uh, these slides are there for you to look at. They are, uh, you, I've shared these slides so you can look at the inputs. And we have a brief as well that's uh, been distributed. So you could look at the input. So we're looking at the under five mortality rate for each of these four countries, Chad, Guinea, Somalia, and South Sudan, and also the deaths that are attributable to pneumonia and diarrhea specifically. So these are the inputs, and they're taken from the latest estimates from the MCEE, the, that's the Maternal and Child Epidemiology Estimation Group that's also based at Johns Hopkins, and also the UN Interagency group for the child mortality estimates, the, the uh, IGNI estimates. 
The other inputs that go into the model would be the cause specific mortality. And this would be what proportion of these pneumonia deaths are actually attributable to pneumococcus, strep pneumonia, which is the bacteria we're trying to prevent using PCV. And similarly, what is the proportion of deaths attributable to rotavirus vaccine? And these numbers are taken directly from the literature, and that's input into the model. The next aspect is vaccine efficacy, and this is also taken from the literature from Cochrane reviews that tell us what the three-dose PCV vaccine efficacy is to prevent vaccine-type invasive pneumococcal disease. And uh, similarly for pneumonia as well as meningitis, both are taken into consideration and also the rotavirus diarrhea. So I'm going through them quickly, but of course these are always there for you to refer to. And um, when we look at coverage, so we're saying that 2024 is when these two vaccines would be introduced in these countries and that there would be a linear scale up. So this is a, a linear model and that's why we're using a linear approach to the scale up. And we're seeing our, the, the immunization agenda 2030 targets of 90% coverage would be what we um, aim for. But you can see that the early years, 2024, 25, um, they are quite conservative. Typically countries, once they introduce a vaccine, within two to three years at the most, they, they come up to their regular routine vaccine coverage. So we are intentionally going with a conservative estimate to get these numbers. And then, Catch-up vaccination is something that is relatively new, and I have to credit Veronica Denti for bringing this question up at one of our earlier discussions. It wasn't there within the tool, so all these inputs had to be put in, in terms of the assumptions. So we, we actually don't have good efficacy numbers for a catch-up campaign for PCV. So we went ahead with looking at the efficacy of a single-dose PCV vaccine, and, that, and that's what we input into the model, and also in terms of coverage, and how much of the population would you cover typically using a catch-up strategy. We don't have anything to go by, but we went with other vaccines like measles. Now, measles is often used in catch-up approaches, so that's how we went with the number 58% of the eligible population. And when we say eligible population, we are referring to children 12 months to 59 months, so above one year of age. They're typically the ones that the catch-up strategy is aimed at. And these are children who have received, the, who have not received the routine vaccination from the previous year and who are not caught up the previous year. So every year, the proportion would change in terms of what is this eligible population. So all of that went in to understand what is the catch-up uh, assumption. This is just a snapshot of what the inside workings of the model does. It's very complicated, and here I've only taken some vaccines. And of course, there are many other interventions. Um, but you can see that often it's not just a linear approach. So it's like it's not that you give rotavirus vaccine and then you can save X number of lives. Rotavirus, they also, there's interactions between the vaccine. For instance, Rotavirus vaccine prevents a huge number of diarrhea cases. Children who get recurrent diarrhea have malnutrition, loss of antibodies, things that protect them against other infections. So indirectly, rotavirus vaccine also prevents a child dying of pneumonia. So that's how the interaction is. So some of those factors are also within the model as well. But of course, it's not perfect. So Coming to the results that we have. So remember I said there are these five different scenarios. So they, we just included all the scenarios just so that it's easy for us to take whichever we want in terms of how do we use these numbers to show the impact that is expected. So the four countries are listed here, Chad, Guinea, Somalia, and South Sudan, and we have the five scenarios, PCV alone, PCV plus catch-up, rotavirus, and, and so on. And the final column is all the three, so PCV plus rotavirus plus the PCV catch-up campaign. Um, and you can see the numbers, they are um, substantial. They are, these are the numbers that are cumulative numbers of lives saved of children one to 59 months of age, 
from 2024 to 2030. Um, so I won't go through the numbers individually, but they're there for your reference. But it, it is substantial when you think of the number of lives saved. And I also want to draw your attention to the, that pyramid. So there's plenty of impact that you get with saving these many numbers of children's lives. The next output is the potential cases averted among these children age one month to 59 months. Again, this, these are cumulative numbers, and you can see the numbers that um, increase when you add the additional interventions of PCV plus catch-up plus the rotavirus vaccine. They're quite substantial, reaching close to a million in, in many of these countries. So I, I want to present the same data in a more visual way, so it may be easier to understand this in terms of just look, instead of just looking at numbers. Um, on the x-axis for each of the four countries represented in the different colors, you have the years. So every year, we're saving potential cases from happening. And all these numbers are shown each of the years. On the y-axis, we have the cases averted per year. And all of them together give you that cumulative number of cases averted through 2030. And so that's the number represented in each of the countries would be the actually the area under the curve that you're seeing in these. So totally, you know, we, we save in, in terms of advocacy, we say that we are preventing 2.6 million cases of very severe pneumonia and diarrhea with these interventions. So that's what all of you are planning and, and doing, which is amazing if you think about it. So the same numbers I've presented here in terms of what happened, wh what do we gain extra when we introduce this catch-up strategy, which as we learned, that is quite a unique strategy when, when we think of introducing of catch-up at the time of new vaccine introduction. So what we're seeing here are the potential cases averted of severe pneumonia, meningitis, and diarrhea in children one to 59 months of age, cumulatively from 2024 to 2030. The, the dark blue bars represent a scenario where only PCV is introduced, and the light blue bars represent when PCV and catch-up is introduced. And you can see the number of cases that you're saving with just this introduction of PCV. And remember, we're saying it's just one to two months of the campaign. You know, doing the outreach and including children that are above one year of age um, in, in getting the catch-up. So you can see the impact. And we also heard from Veronica yesterday that in terms of resources spent on doing this campaign, it's not, it's not a huge amount. You, you can slide it in with the resources that you will be using for new vaccine introduction. And that's why it's so important and it's exciting that many of us in the room are um, very supportive of this introduction. And we've just listed the advantages of the catch-up. Of course, you have additional lives saved, but in terms of reaching children that are above one year of age who are typically outside of the whole immunization system, you're also increasing your herd immunity or community protection by catching these children. And the other approach is that there is an impact on your zero-dose burden because you are catching children who are already out of the immunization system. In addition, we are, of course, we're only talking of PCV and rota, but when you catch these children outside of the immunization system, here's an opportunity for you to catch them up on other routine vaccines as well. And not only vaccines, but why not extend to other child health measures? And we heard the beautiful experience from Dr. Nevio Saramento yesterday on Thursday on their experience in Timor-Leste of integrating a package of interventions. And we heard from our colleagues in Somalia that that's what they're thinking about as well, in including things like nutrition counseling or deworming or vitamin A. There are plenty of things that can be added to improve child survival using this strategy. So just wanted to highlight uh, everything else you get with catch up. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the economic benefits. And I have to say that I'm uh, a pediatrician, a clinician, and not a health economist, but we have a fantastic health ec ec um, economics team at IVAC, and 
they did all this work and I'm just presenting it. So uh, they use this approach called, called cost of illness averted and value of statistical life using these, so these are well-recognized, well-evidenced models um, that have been developed and they, they calculated the costs averted. So you have treatment costs, which are very direct, they're observable costs. If a child does not need to go to the hospital, you're saving that much in terms of treatment. So that's treatment costs. And then you have others like transportation and wages. So all of those can be saved when you avert a case or, if, or a death even. And then you have the unobservable costs, which are productivity loss due to disability and productivity loss due to death. And this is calculated based on a fact that if a child did not die at that age, what would the child have produced in terms of economic productivity for a lifetime? And, and this is um, specific to different countries, so it takes lifespan and earning capacity and many of these aspects per country. So all of those inputs go in into calculating these costs. And then if you add them all up, you have total costs. So these are all the cost um, uh, categories that we have, but I'm only going to present the treatment and the total costs because um, maybe it's just easier to look at treatment costs because that's very tangible. I, any government would say, how much are we saving? We're putting in so much to pay for the vaccines or pay for the delivery costs or the training and all the aspects. Now, how much are we getting back? And that's the treatment cost. It's very direct. So you can see for Chad, Guinea, Somalia, and South Sudan. The first table is on PCV alone, just PCV introduced, and then rotavirus vaccine alone is the second table. And you can see the numbers are quite substantial. So it's almost half a million in, in many of these countries. These numbers and the, the variations, of course, would depend on the size of the country, the population, and so on. So I won't, again, go through each of the numbers, but you can see they are substantial. And, and here you have the total costs for the entire uh, intervention that includes PCV, rotavirus, and rotavirus vaccine, and the PCV catch-up strategy. So if you include these, the, that's the fifth scenario that I presented. So we have the treatment costs and the total averted costs. Remember the total consists of everything else, which includes the transportation, wages, productivity, loss, and all of that put together. So that is substantial. You can see these numbers are almost astronomical. So it's Chad would say, if you, if you just look at treatment costs, as I said earlier, these are more specific and tangible, easier to understand. So Chad would save over 1.5 million. For Guinea, it is 1.7. Somalia is 2.5. And South Sudan, 1.6. Of course, these are estimated numbers, and they're based on the estimates that we provided for lives saved and cases averted. But they are substantial. That is the take-home message from this exercise that I have. So th those, that's the extent of the results we have. But just to uh, keep in mind the caveats, these are modeled estimates, and whatever outputs we have, it's just based on what we've input. And I went through some of the inputs that we have. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, we also just considered PCV and Rota. Another thing to keep in mind, there are many other routine vaccines that have a big role in preventing pneumonia and diarrhea, like TTP, Hib, measles. These are critical vaccines, and we should never lose sight of the importance of these routine vaccines. And so every time we introduce new vaccines, there should be the same kind of push to keep the coverage up in terms of sustainability of coverage of the routine vaccines. And then the big picture is something I want to highlight when we look at these numbers, right? The big picture is that it's not, it's never only about vaccines. It's about all the other things we have to do as well and focus on just prevention. So simple things like promoting breastfeeding and treatment aspects, those, those are also critical, availability of antibiotics, oxygen, zinc, ORS. So all of those things are important. 
And then distant factors, which we heard about also, which is things like uh, promoting maternal education and other determinants. So vaccines are only part of the solution. Of course, we're all for vaccines, but if we put it in perspective, so I've just taken an example of post-neonatal diarrhea mortality. So you have all the green boxes, which are the prevention interventions, and the blue boxes are the treatment interventions. So rotavirus vaccine is just one aspect of the many things that can be done, including vitamin A, zinc, clean water, wash facilities, and so on. So all of those things that contribute towards reducing diarrhea mortality in children. So that's what I want to keep in mind in terms of vaccines. But vaccines are also critical because it's, it's a very specific thing. And it is something that we're all working towards. So in terms of understanding the, the, the results and how do we propagate it, it's so critical to think about the vaccine advocacy and public health messaging. And we, we talked a bit about that yesterday as well. And Laura Lochlein talked about the missed opportunities of vaccination as, as well as the social and behavioral drivers of, of vaccination. So that's very important to highlight. It's thing, those are things that we can do to reduce barriers that come up. And just an example on the right side is something that the Vaccine Impact Modeling Consortium did. They, they did a very simple publication in this online journal, which is Science Journal for Kids and Teens, to show the impact of vaccines. So it's very simply shown how vaccines can save 37 million lives between 2000 and 2019, and the projection of how many more millions of lives can be saved in the future. So it's important for us to think about the whole messaging. It should be simple, not too complicated, and um, believable as well, and open, so that questions can be asked and answered, so vaccine messaging. The second thing is we talked about the importance of catch-up in routine immunization and all the advantages that go along with that. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So it's fantastic that we've been talking so much about actually practicing and putting it into practice and implementation of catch-up. And then finally, the whole aspect of primary health care, bundling of interventions that we talked about. And, and immunization, vaccines, new vaccine introduction gives us that opportunity. So we shouldn't lose sight of that opportunity. We heard Dr. Benjamin and Kajina yesterday talk about vaccine equity. And immunization is a way to actually work towards equity, health equity for all. So I will stop there and um, thank, I want to thank the entire, the team that went behind this presentation, the GAP team um, at John Hopkins, particularly Sarah Navia, who is not here today, but she's the one who did a lot of the, the modeling, and Jasmine Huber, who was also part of our team, who made these beautiful slides. I want to acknowledge the LIST team, the LifeSave team, who also helped and verified these numbers. And of course, the health economics team led by Brian Patner and the PCE subgroup. And I really want to thank Valentina and Marianne uh, and the organizers for this meeting. It was just wonderful to have all of us together. And thank you for our host country, Chad, as well, for having us. Thank you. <laughs>